video of the show, the live sound of you too. middle of their triumphant American tour in support of their debut album Boy, U2 began writing new songs for their second record. The band felt a certain pressure to following up the well-received Boy and continuing their determined march to mainstream popularity. Their record label Island had faith that they would become a financially successful and profitable endeavor while fans were clamoring for more U2. The band members, however, constantly stressed under the burden of improving upon the hits of Out of Control and I Will Follow. As Edge recalled, they had their entire lives to make their first record and only a few weeks to make their second. As they began preparing, disaster struck early. Backstage at a show in Portland, Oregon, a briefcase containing lyrics and other musical ideas written by Bono disappeared after the band's performance. Unsure of whether it was stolen or just misplaced, the police were contacted but were ultimately unable to retrieve the briefcase. This was only the beginning of one of the most difficult and unforgiving eras in the band's history. Once the band returned to Ireland, they planned to start the recording process, but were running low on funds. After asking for a few favors, they were able to rent a studio in the music room of the school where they all met, Mount Temple. It was here that the beginnings of the songs on their second album began to take shape, mostly through musical improvisation. The members of U2 were accustomed to figuring out songs through prolonged jam sessions, with Bono figuring out the lyrics and melodies afterward. But for the first time, they had a timeline to adhere to. Deadlines crept up on Bono, and with only a few days left at the school, practically none of the lyrics for the album had been written yet. He decided to lock himself in one of his old classrooms and will himself to finishing the songs. It was in this hysteric desperation that Bono came up with the lyrics to Gloria. The lyrics from the chorus of Gloria originate from a Gregorian chant in Latin, translating to Glory in you, Lord, Glory, Joy. These lyrics, along with many of the following songs, educe an overtly Christian tone. This was seen as an act of defiance for Bono. He thought singing about something uncool like Christianity and the rock and roll genre was a different form of rebelliousness. I Threw a Brick Through a Window was written about self-loathing, a topic that Bono usually does not like to put in the forefront of U2's music. These lyrics reflect the narrator's disgust with his own image, and when he's faced with his own reflection, wanting to destroy it. I say one thing, I say rejoice! And we will rejoice! Whatever, whenever, right now! Rejoice! The song Rejoice evokes the same imagery as last album's I Will Follow, about the symbolism of buildings and city infrastructure falling down upon itself. It's falling, it's falling, and outside a building comes tumbling down. There's a twinge of juxtaposition between the song's dark and sometimes somber lyrics and its own title, Rejoice. While Bono goes into depth about the destruction that comes with daily life, he decides to turn his back to it, and instead chooses to see the joy in life, and the strength to do so comes from his faith in Christianity. He outright prays to God, asking, What am I to do? Just tell me, what am I supposed to say? While trying to uphold his volitional duty of ignoring and avoiding the devastation in the world, the singer finds his mantra. I can change the world. I can change the world in me. But I say, I rejoice. You know, we say, fight it, rejoice, <laughs> go for it. To 
Tomorrow is another song written hastily on a deadline by Bono. At the time, he considered the lyrics to be generic, just to have something written for the song. It wasn't until years later Bono decided that he was actually recalling the memory of his mother's funeral. Outside, somebody's outside, somebody's not killed at the door. There's a black car parked on the side of the road. Some go to the door, some go to the door. The lyrics quickly transition from a narrative to a melancholy monologue. Go in sad mother. Go in Bono continues speaking to his mother while trying to overcome his loneliness living without her. Confronted with this loss, Bono turns back to his policy of praising God in the face of depression and hopelessness. The topic of Christianity is a continuous theme in the lyrics of U2's second album, and Tomorrow is no exception. After finishing their first draft of the album, U2 returned to the studio where they recorded their first record, Windmill Lane Studios, and rejoined with their producer Steve Lillywhite. He helped the band regain some of their experimental side from their first record, again having the band play their instruments in large, open locations like warehouses to capture the first album's unique sound. While most of the songs were getting finished, Larry Mullen Jr. was having a particularly difficult time with his part on the track I Threw a Brick Through a Window. Holding a consistent tempo between recordings was becoming an issue with him, and his refusal to use a click track was exacerbating the problem. Late in the process of recording the tracks, Larry came into the studio only to find that The Edge had recorded some of the drums on the song to get the process moving forward. It was only then that Larry had decided to kick himself into shape and definitively learn the song to work out all the issues and finish recording. The band was still having difficulty completing the songs, and in an effort to work the rest of the kinks out, they decided to play a show with Thin Lizzy at Slane Castle, promoting the new material. They reasoned that playing the songs live would help them understand the music more fully, and improve the album before its release. Slane Castle was also the largest music venue in Ireland, and they felt they couldn't turn down the offer. As the band members recall, it was one of the worst shows that they had ever played. Through a mess of technical problems and lack of coordination and preparation, U2 had failed on the biggest stage in their home country. Defeated, they trudged back into the studio to finish the record. As the album was nearing completion, the struggle of juggling their roles as rock and rollers while simultaneously being dedicated Christians came to the forefront for some of the members of U2. Bono, The Edge, and Larry had been members of the Irish faith community Shalom for years and held weekly prayer meetings. Over time, Edge came to the realization that he could no longer reconcile the seemingly paradoxical relationship between the band and his faith. He told Bono and nobody else that he was leaving U2. In a show of solidarity and similarly convinced, Bono also agreed to leave. A meeting was held with the members of the band, Lily White, and manager Paul McGinnis to tell the rest of the group their decision. But Lily White and McGinnis ultimately disagreed with the two band members' premise. The producer tried to reason with their mindset, pointing out that using their spotlight as recording artists to shine on topics that they felt were important would give them a greater opportunity in their faith to bring others to God than just being solely members of the church. McGinnis, on the other hand, appealed to their ethical side. Venues were already booked and crew assembled for upcoming performances. He argued, if God had something to say about this tour, he should have raised his hand a little earlier. The two of them convinced Bono and Edge not to leave the band, at least for now. After this conversion, the members of U2 limped their way to finishing the record, feeling bruised and unsure of the future. Nevertheless, U2 released their second album, October, on October 12, 1981. Do I care? 
The title October is meant as an allegory to how the members of U2 perceived how the early 80s resulted from the industrial boom of the 60s and 70s. Just like how October symbolizes the exodus of summer and the changing of the seasons, stripping the trees of their greenery, U2 drew a parallel to how Europe was hyper-focused on the new age of technology without regard for the larger effects it would have on the world as a whole. October, it's, it's an image. We've been through a time where, if you like, uh, things were in full bloom, you know, everybody thought, you know, how great mankind was. Maybe we weren't so smart after all. After the band decided their preferred photo for the album cover, the record company swiftly opposed U2's decision. Island believed that there was no style or direction to this image, while Bono argued for the Irish imagery of the Dublin docks and wanting them represented on the cover of the album. After many meetings with the record company and sending multiple representatives to try and talk the band out of their decision, Bono and the rest of U2 held fast and didn't budge. Ultimately, the final say on the image used for their album covers was given to the band in their contract, so they didn't truly consider it a fight about this specific photo, but rather about their artistic control in general, and how it would define their relationship with Ireland. My voice is gone, as you can hear it, it's gone, that I felt it's important to, to try and break through in another way. You know, sometimes people don't listen to you with your voice, so you, you do anything you want, you, you climb up on things. You could even climb up here. You see, people would follow you and they pay much more attention to you when you're up here. Whatever, whatever you do, once you climb up, things, things happen. <laughs> Despite the evangelical tones on the album, no salvation was in sight for U2 in terms of radio play and album sales. October wasn't matching the success of Boy and was seen as a step back for the band. Puzzlingly though, U2 was still receiving a remarkable amount of demand for touring. They were often booked into theaters to play to thousands of fans. Eventually they came to realize that these were test markets for a new idea called music television. Ladies and gentlemen, rock and roll. U2 had been an artist of interest for them because Gloria was one of the more popular music videos at the time. This is it. Welcome to MTV Music Television. The world they became the first MTV band, and their airplay helped U2 stay afloat during their sophomore slump. Oh, Music Television asked U2 to say hello to you on St. Patrick's Day. So that's what we're doing. Still, October was seen as a financial failure by the band and the record company. By the end of the tour, revenue from the shows had only gotten the band enough money for their plane tickets back to Ireland, not even enough to fully pay the crew members for the tour. Paul McGuinness recalls this as a particularly dark moment for himself and the band, especially because of his behavior of taking any setback with U2's popularity as a personal failure. U2 returned to Ireland not with their heads held high, but with a sense of frustration and uncertainty. We're not about escapism as a band, we're very very aware of, of the things that are happening in the world around us. But at the same time, we hate, we hate being negative as people. We're very positive in our yeah. outlook. No matter how bad things seem, we're always, you know, looking on the, on the bright side. <laughs> Meanwhile in New York, Island Records was deliberating what to do with U2. Their second album had flopped, and some were wondering if the band were as promising as they had initially envisioned. At the last minute, owner of Island Records Chris Blackwell stepped in, telling the other executives to let the band give it another go, and give U2 an opportunity to redeem themselves with their next record. Members of U2 recall this as an instrumental time in the band's history, saying that if they had been with any other record company, they would have been dropped immediately. Instead, the band remained on the Island label for now, saved at the last minute by Blackwell. The members of U2 knew that their next album was a make-or-break moment, and were determined that this would be the advent of their big break into stardom. Yeah. 